basically the United States says you're an enemy, you're an enemy, you're an enemy. You know, we're out looking for enemies. That's what neutrality would be nice. What if why couldn't we just say, and actually Trump, I think, did say that. He said, I would like to have a cordial relationship with Putin because I don't want to fight Russia. <laughs> yeah, he I said mean, that. And it was radical. <laughs> normally thinking people would say the U.S. having a good relationship with Russia, the U.S. having a good relationship with China and China. Europe and South America is a good thing. But yes. <laughs> there's there's unfortunately people who manage to spin that into a bad thing because yeah. only... Well, it's it's true. And, and actually, there are not that many people doing it. It is the people that control the airwaves. You know, it's the think tanks. This is what Ray McGovern calls the Mickey, the Mickey mat. It's the military industrial intelligence complex, but it's also big pharma, think tanks, uh, media, all of these things together. They all benefit from war, from crisis. Donald Trump is already the first time, but even more so now in the, the second time, is the outcome of the displeasure of a really large proportion yes. of the country. And this this displeasure has like different roots, but a very large part of that is the is the way that a lot of people don't want these uh, wars to, co to right. continue into warfare, right? This is a large segment. And actually also the fact that a lot of Democrats defected yeah. to him, like Tulsi Gabbard, uh, RFK Jr. Uh, I mean, uh, Elon Musk as well was like, a, I'm not sure if he was a member of the of the Democrats, but at least uh, he was, it was very, yeah, very they, close to them. And yeah. all of them defected there. And this is the kind of people who would like to to um, yeah. dial it down. And as you said, go into defense rather rather than offense mode. So in a sense, this now the, the, the popular wave yeah. against this militarism is getting un, um, unignorable. So in a sense, I, yeah. I believe that also the Pentagon needs will probably understand that something has to change, even if it's not the way that Donald Trump is uh, is yeah. wanting to do it. Yeah. But don't you think that this is, is really a, a new moment? I mean, this is bigger is, than it, Vietnam, isn't yeah. it? It is, an, it is a new moment. But I will say this. If you look at the presidents who have been elected, uh, really uh, since since uh, Kennedy, but really since LBJ, because you remember the famous, when, when he ran against Goldwater and um, he made Goldwater out to be the, the president that would cause World War III, that he would be the president that caused a nuclear weapon to uh, explode in the United States. That was LBJ's painting of his opponent. So LBJ wins. LBJ, terribly corrupt, terribly uh, uh, immoral and dishonest person. But his campaign was, at that time, the campaign for peace. And every president since who has won an election has always, always talked about they are the peace candidate, whether it's Republican or Democrat, it didn't matter. And George Bush the second. remember we had George Bush, uh, not the second, George Bush 43. George W. Bush Jr., yeah. So he also was the peace candidate. And I, I was, uh, I paid close attention to his um, election. And I remember, uh, oh my gosh, this guy sounds really good. This was before my awakening that they were all lying all the time. But he, he talked about, um, didn't use the words America first, but he talked about, you know, not having foreign wars, staying, you know, making America strong, but also not involving ourselves in other people's issues. And hearing it from a guy like uh, George W. Bush, he was not too bright to begin with. It it was pretty, it was a simple message from a simple person. And I think it was a little bit believable. Um, and now interesting, you know, Gore, who his opponent was, Gore was also not advocating wars. Um, but as soon as uh, Bush was elected, I mean, we were at war. We were at World 9-11 happened, but 9-11 um, but had, had a long set of precursors to it that um, people around George Bush were very involved in because they wanted war. And Cheney, who, you know, Cheney is, was the vice president, um, he's very much wanted war and made money and profited from war, both before and after he was uh, vice president. So war it was. So this deep state, this permanent bureaucracy, this set of Washington interests got the wars they wanted, regardless of what the people said. And over and over and over. And finally, Trump lands on 
he gets elected and he is the anti-Hillary, whose Hillary is the loves war, never wants to fight one, but is happy to send everyone else's kids to go. So Trump wins and then he loses. Nobody knows how. And then he wins again. But he's a different guy. But he's still actually he believes his rhetoric. He believes it. And one of his selling points was how many wars did I get you in when I was president? Well, none. That was great. How did that happen? Nobody knows, but it happened. And that was the selling point. And the other thing about the Democrats is, of course, you know, they made him out to be a, a very bad guy and all these things. But the average Democrat is a it is that is the peace party. That was the peace party. And many, many Democrats, whether they voted for Trump or he even hate Trump personally, embrace that same thing. So you are right about the overwhelming majority of Americans um they want to pay attention to America. They want to put America first. They don't want wars overseas for no reason. Now, we are in this situation where, as you described, large military industrial complex, large Pentagon um, overspending and too many people. And we are not even sure. We know that sometimes the president cannot actually control it. We know that sometimes mm -hmm. Congress cannot hold con control it. We know that the people who are involved in this are build a system. And the system is now inside an international environment that is striving toward away from hegemony, away from a unipolar moment and into a multipolar moment. To me, this is quite scary in the sense that I think there's a lot of potential for things to go very, very wrong. And the United States doing something that under on the rational thinking you wouldn't yeah. expect. Now, if we take all that into consideration, if you were the advisor to China and to Russia, how would you tell these other two superpowers how to handle the, mm. how to approach the US in order to not collapse globally? Well, that's a really good question. I think that what they are already doing makes sense in the sense that they are watching from a distance, kind of, you know, black box, you know, take take the United States, look at not so much what its rhetoric is, what it actually does, and what it's failing at. And, and there are big problems. I mean, militarily alone, there are big problems. Fiscal policy alone, there are big problems. You know, we have many problems that are impacting how we are going to, uh, either keep or lose, which it's probably be lose, our unipolar power, you know, and, and politically, the politicians still want to be the number one power, but the people in America have already voted. And they're like, if it means wars that we don't want to pay for, that we don't understand, that we don't support, when we need to do things here at home, then we don't care about being whatever you're calling this unipolar power. You know, I mean, Americans, this this country was, I mean, for for uh, almost, uh, what, 150 years, the country was very much a trading country. You know, we weren't number one and Americans were quite happy not to be number one. This, wasn't, this is actually something that has been pasted on top of what it is to be an American. Um, it never was about being number one. It was about... A land of opportunity. It was about liberty. It was about freedom to be left alone. That was, it was a very libertarian concept, this country was. We were, uh, the people who built this country were largely leaving other places so they could have space and time and less government. They've told us we're number one since World War II. Who's they? Well, Washington has told us that, you know. So, I don't think for the American people, they're insisting that, oh, we have to be number one. We have to go beat up everybody. We have to make everybody do what we tell them. Most Americans are not like that. In fact, Americans will not even tell their neighbors what to do. They won't tell their family members what to do. I mean, we we are not that way. So what we have really is a Washington problem. We have a Washington uh, elite, ruling elite olig oligarchy problem. That oligarchy has invested in this narrative of number one, and they've made a lot of money from it too. They've, they've gained power and made money. Um, that's the world that they know. That's the world the neocons embrace. The, I mean, the neoconservative uh, philosophy is that we are the global policemen because we deserve to be, because we are, you know, we have the best ideas. It's very, it's a very arrogant approach. Um, most Americans are not arrogant. In fact, most Americans, you know, they, they don't even know what's going on in the rest of the world, I have to tell you. And they don't care. And that's fine. That's totally fine. 
you know, really? I don't expect people in the rest of the world to know what's going on in our country. Um, people have their own lives and, absolutely and, and, that's, and that's okay. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating to me in, in U.S. history is that there are two foreign policy pillars upon which I think the United States grew uh, rich and important. One was the Monroe Doctrine. The other one was actually its neutrality policy towards Europe and towards foreign wars. And that oh, one sure. went completely yeah. away. That lasted for 150 years. And the current narrative yeah. completely yeah. reframed U.S. neutrality as isolationism in order yeah. to right. make sure it doesn't come back. Uh, but yeah. it was such a pivotal pillar for its for its industrial might that I wonder if that's not a, a mistake, actually. Shouldn't this come back? Yeah, I mean, they have. They've made isolationism a dirty word. And actually, it's not even a word that can really even be applied to any country in this era at all. We're all connected. Um, we're connected in so many ways, but it's almost it's we're connected visually. It's like right now we could, we're in the same room. Well, we're not in the same room. We're halfway around the world, but we're in the same room. So we're not going back to a time when we couldn't be connected. We are connected. There's no way to for anyone to be isolated. Um, yeah. certainly there's no way for a country to be isolated. So that word has no meaning when it's applied to foreign policy. So it is a uh, pejorative. It is a pejorative to people in America and anywhere else who would advocate that we pay attention to our business and not your business and not other people's business. I wonder if that couldn't be brought back in a sense that, you know, the word isolation is no, nobody who was a pro-neutralist at the time described yeah. themselves as isolationist. They described themselves as neutralist. And the interesting thing is that the first America first uh, movement uh, was actually a neutralist movement of people who said we should not get involved in the Second World War yeah. right? I, 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 before oh, that. Wow. I mean, we should not yeah, get involved yeah, yeah, into exactly. the escalation yeah. in Europe. Sure. And if there is not a way to actually bring back the idea that, um, you know, it's fine not to go to war everywhere. Right. And we, if we can yeah. defend ourselves, that's what we need. I mean, this is yeah. what you've been talking about. And no, if not, true. this needs it's to true. be counteracted. Well, one of the things, and you talked about the popular opinion and, and it, that what you have just described, that is America's popular opinion. And they have spoken. They've spoken multiple times, but they've spoken most recently. And we have a president or a coming president and a vice president who um, totally get what the people are saying. They get it. And they are the bridge to the thing that's preventing us from putting America first, from the, the thing that's causing us to continually engage in wars and in and, uh, uh, dealing with, you know, involving ourselves with other countries' business and telling people what to do. And that's Washington. That is inside of Washington, inside of the Beltway, connected a little bit to the East Coast and West Coast Coast oligarchs. So we have this very thin veneer of a ruling class and they like to engage and fight. They like other people's kids to die for them. I mean, honestly, look at Ukraine. We, we have we have up front in our Congress, in our own Congress, we have Congressman uh, Lindsey Graham. You still have people in Ukraine. You should keep fighting. What does that mean? You know, your people are dying so that our guys don't have to. He basically said that. Two Ukrainians. I mean, help, we talk about tone deaf, but he he. Th this is how they view it. Well, those guys are gone. They don't they don't have popularity. Their message doesn't resonate with Americans. We don't have the money to keep doing that. So a lot of things are coming together that could lead to one of two things: either we're going to fix this country with the, with radical reduction in government, a reformation of our military focus, reformation of our foreign policy focus, or this country is going to go bankrupt and it's going to collapse. And that will not be pleasant for many, many people. That will not be pleasant. It will not be productive. And we will be vulnerable during that time. Uh, that it would actually, we would be vulnerable to martial law domestically in parts of the country. And we would be vulnerable to um, our so-called enemies, which basically the United States says, you're an enemy, you're an enemy, you're an enemy. You know, we're out looking for enemies. That's what neutrality would be nice. What if, why couldn't we just say, and actually Trump, I think did say that. He said, I would like to have a cordial relationship with Putin because I don't want to fight Russia. <laughs> he I mean, he I mean, said that and it was radical. <laughs> normally thinking people would say, the U.S. having a good relationship with Russia and the U.S. having a good relationship with China and China. Europe and South America is a good thing. But yes. 
there's there's unfortunately people who manage to spin that into a bad thing because yeah. only well, it's it's true and and actually there're not that many people doing it it is the people that control the airwaves you know it's the think tanks this is what Ray McGovern calls the Mickey the Mickey mat it's the military industrial intelligence complex but it's also big pharma think tanks uh media all of these things together they all benefit from war from crisis um they make money they uh, justify their existence and and the interesting thing you know we talk about what we have to do to fix it well whether we fix it or not whether trump is able to uh fix anything right because he he does have an idea that he wants to fix things he may or may not be able to do that but even if he doesn't almost every part of this layer that controls uh, American foreign policy, America war policy, and American domestic policy, all of these people that want wars and want conflicts and want to spend a lot of money to do it, they're all collapsing in their own way. We talked about the weaknesses in the military, logistical weaknesses, leadership weaknesses. You know, we can't recruit people. I mean, we're a massive, we have 335 million people and we can't find, we can't find half a million recruits a year to replace the people that are getting out. We can't find half a million qualified, physically and mentally qualified people that want to serve in the military. Well, that's a good sign, okay? Because that's how things collapse. <laughs> when you mm -hmm. can't recruit, you don't have an all volunteer force. Then you go to a draft. If you have a draft, you have people inside the system who don't want to be there and they will change the, the very nature of your system changes. And we may need that. We may have to have that if, if we can't, fix it from top-down directives or legislation, you know, that, that can help us shrink our government and refocus it into what the Americans really want it to be. If we can't do that, it'll be done for us because the military can't sustain itself. We have 18 intelligence agencies. It used to be 12 or 13 when I was in the military. Now it's 18. Every government, every part of government seems to have its own intelligence agency with its funding, much of which is secret. Um, what are they doing? Who are they spying on? What are they doing with the information? Well, you know, I don't know, but I got a feeling it's a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of it is working at cross purposes. It's not it's not effective. OK, it's a waste of money. Fire them all. We'd never know the difference. And, and that's probably true. If you got rid of we have 18 intelligence agencies, if you brought it down to one or two, would anyone in this country notice? No, we wouldn't notice at all. We would be better for it, but we wouldn't even notice it. It, it, it They add no value. Um, you take uh, the Department of Agriculture, and this is a number that's been bandied about forever, but, um, you know, we have a Department of Agriculture and we have, I think, something like six to nine employees with the Department of Agriculture for every single farmer in this country. What are they doing? Uh, nobody knows what they're doing. Well, they, they, they bring food to the, to the schools, you know, they do all kinds of things that is way beyond their original mission and it's certainly not necessary. Um, Department of Education. We have a department. It's not very big. Takes a little bit of takes a few billions. It finances all the the student loan debt that's crushing the dreams for uh, people from twenty to sixty because they all this debt that never ends and interest is horrendous on this debt can't get out from under it. That's all government did that. Uh, oh, are we smarter? No, our kids can't perform at the nineteen forties level when they get out. A third of our students graduate high school. They cannot read. They cannot do math. So these systems are dying from within. They are not adding value. If they collapse tomorrow due to uh, our money, I, I say we have a financial collapse and nobody gets paid. Nobody walks off the job. The government people walk off the job because there's no money. Imagine they, if they did that, we wouldn't notice. No one would notice yeah, because they, they're not adding value. The danger is, of course, that the U.S. might be nearing uh, the point that the Soviet Union uh, was coming to in the 1980s, right? Yes. And 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 you know, uh, civil strife and civil unrest and and civil violence yes. is a huge danger, and and everybody in the world will be very scared of that. Again, for the same yes. reason, because the U.S. has so much war potential and, and and nuclear weapons, right? So the last thing we would want is a collapse, uh, an an all an unorderly collapse of the U.S. What you would well, want is a is a orderly restructuring and reintegration into a into the yes. global system that then ends up being like peaceful and prosperous for everybody right that's that's that would be ideal yeah that would be ideal um 
And again, since we don't know, and you can't tell how it's going to come out, I can tell you this, um, and, and you know this, anybody reading the news knows this, our government for a long time now, um, since before 9-11, uh, but certainly even more after that, certainly we've been at war, but they have also been planning uh, to militarily deal with uh, internal security yeah. collapses. Yeah. Not defense from an enemy, but the enemy within. And that term has actually been used. It was used in this last campaign by the Democrats, the enemy within. Um, both parties look at the other one, you know, if they're if they're hostile to each other and they see an enemy and they see people that don't want to follow the rules. And this is a societal breakdown. This is um, a precursor to it. And our government is very aware of it. Um, but just like our government doesn't have great leadership in making foreign policy decisions, you know, it goes into war, it it gets itself sucked into things. I, I consider Israel something that we have gotten sucked into rather than something that serves American interests. You know, we, we have, uh, for many years, Israel has been this thing that has been useful to us in the Middle East. But actually now, and for many years now, it has not been useful to us. It has actually been <laughs> very detrimental to the United States, our, our relationship um, that we cling to with Israel and that Israel clings to with us. So these this this reflects very poor decision making and uh, uh, not very rational decision making at the top. And that same poor decision making and irrationality at the top will come into play if society breaks down. So this idea that, oh, we have a plan for societal breakdown. We have a plan for martial law. Good luck with that. Good luck with that, because I don't think I think it'll be just like their plan to clear uh, the ship traffic in the Red Sea. Yeah, we have a plan for that. It didn't yeah. work out, though, did it? Um, and it won't work out domestically. So the other countries, the great powers, any of the great powers, China, Russia, India, any country that trades with us, they need to. I, I would say the best thing to do is what they're already doing, and that is to give us a wide berth and to study us to some extent, because what you hear from Washington, just like we've talked about, is not what the people of America want or believe, and it's, and we will not fight for Washington. Um, I think one of the reasons that we see so many, we see proxy wars being very popular, and also the high-tech nature of wars, where you don't have to send a lot of people, and you can just drone them to death. I mean, we did a lot of damage in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, but total numbers of troops we took a very small number of troops and we rotated them in four or five, six times, you know. So the same guys in Afghanistan fought six years there over time, you know, a year there, a little back home, we go again. So we kept it very much, uh, an ice. we isolated the cost of that war from American people. Um, we do this with, with Ukraine. We say, oh, no Americans are in Ukraine. No, well, they are, but you know, we, we deny that and we say, well, the Ukrainians are fighting the Russians for us. Well, not only is that immoral um, and wrong, but it it postpones the inevitable. Because if we had a war and you asked Americans to fight, it would have to be on our own property. They would not fight anywhere else. They will not do it. So and that's something that our enemies, if you're so-called enemies or anyone that's watching to see what will happen, I think they understand that. So I don't think they see American people as the enemy. It is the same the same enemy that Russia has, the same enemy that China might have, and the same enemy that I have, that people in America have, and the same enemy Trump has, is Washington. It's this warmongering set of you know, a little piece of Maryland, a little piece of Virginia. You know, there are many people in Virginia. I live in Virginia. Many people in Virginia would love to see Northern Virginia cut off into its own entity. Um, it doesn't reflect our values. Okay. Same with Maryland. Um, D.C., it's there. It, 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 I don't even think it reflects D.C.'s values, but at least they make money off of the government. But, um, yeah, there's, there is a... Uh, uh, I mean, I can't see what the future is going to hold. I, I hope we hold off on nuclear weapons and we don't, you know, that there isn't uh, a huge crisis that forces some of these things to happen. But the American people, our enemy is the same enemy that Russia and China deal with. And that is an incompetent and over 
funded government that seeks war first. Yeah, yeah, it's it's of course extremely dangerous because if that if that analysis is is true, again, it means that um, we don't know who's actually steering the ship, and there's a danger that nobody nobody does. There is no captain. Yes. And that yes, is extremely right. dangerous. This is this is what what drove Japan into the second into the Second World War. The the the, the absence or the, the the plurality of decision making parts is yes. extremely dangerous. Um, yes. uh, Karen, um, we are coming to the end, and I, I do need to let you have some dinner at some point. But okay. um, uh, where can people find your your writing? Where do you publish regularly? Yeah, uh, well, um, I have a Substack. Um, they can find it. And I, I, I first give everything to Lou Rockwell. And then after he publishes it, I put it at, at Judge Napolitano's website, judgenap.com, uh, and the op-ed sections. And I, uh, have my sub stack. So it's really just there. And then, um, I actually do a terrible job. I don't, I mean, I do a rotten job. I never collect the various podcasts or anything like that and share them. And I really should start doing that, but I haven't done it. So you could Google and find who knows what people I've talked to that I don't even remember talking to, and there'll be stuff there. But you know, it's just just my opinions. But um, I do think I do think that I sh I am a an average American in this respect. You know, I, I think the things that I'm saying maybe it sounds like I've thought about them or I haven't thought about them. But I think this is how most Americans feel. And I and when I talk to people, they they say, yeah, I agree with this. So. And this needs to be studied. I mean, it's absolutely correct. Uh, the, the U.S. at the moment needs to be studied very, very carefully in order to understand um, how things are working. And we are trying to do that. You know, uh, these discussions are part of trying to study how things actually work. And the, the scary thing is nobody really knows. That's but... true. Well, that's, that's so true. And, and really, the Biden administration, um, which is outgoing, you know, he has had uh, a deficiency in his uh, mental capacity for some time. It, it didn't just happen last summer, and everybody knows that. But it wasn't admitted, and it was hidden successfully. It was hidden by via a conspiracy to hide it from the American people. And yet, this country continued to do all kinds of things. We engaged in, yeah. in a proxy war. We are trying to get at a war with China. All this, that does need to be studied almost academically, almost like you would a Cuban Missile Crisis, where you um, look yeah. at it from various angles. And, and write write the books and and, and really assess and, you know, what the, that means and the chain of commands because you know if the president can be lied to then who tells us that the, that that the secretary right. of defense can't be lied to or that his uh undersecretary right. can't be lied to I mean we that's actually right. don't know where it breaks which is that's very right. and scary that's right and why you why I'm even a person that anybody would even want to talk to about these topics is because 20 years ago I worked with people who were lying. And I saw that they were lying and I didn't, and I was shocked. I was shocked. I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was. And then I started to look historically and this is a long practice. So, you know, truth will set you free. Um, we need to work on that a little bit in this country. Um, we need to expose, we need to pick up rocks and see what's underneath uh, in this country. If we don't do that, we're, we're on track for a, uh, long decline and an ultimate collapse and we don't want an uncontrolled collapse you know we if, if you have to collapse or if you're weak what do you do you start exercising you try to um cut the fat and focus on the mission and make yourself healthy we need to make our country healthy again not just not just physically healthy but as in terms of a, a system that is healthy these are very wise last words. So I'm um, Karen Katowski. Thank you very much for your time today. Okay, well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure.